Well, this morning we'll take a look in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, showing my new extra large print Bible to my mom last night. And she knows that I have in my notes my cheat verses where I usually have my verses written down in my notes here. So she asked me last night, does this mean that you're not going to put so many cheat verses in your message? And so I told her, yes, that we will not use as many of those. So today, I don't have any verses other than the references written on my notes. So this will be the first time in a while I've actually had to flip uh, through to find the actual passages while I'm preaching. Usually I work ahead and do that. But uh, this morning we're going to take a look at 1 Thessalonians. And uh, we are beginning a new year, of course, today being the first day of 2012, the first day of 2012, and um, looking forward to what 2012 has in store for Oak Grove Baptist Church, and in great anticipation of uh, what could happen even in our own spiritual lives and our spiritual growth this year. And of course, at this time of year, we have... Just come through 2011, brought in the new year. We find ourselves uh, looking towards the future. 2011 is forever gone. And now we're looking in, in, in great anticipation for what lies ahead in 2012. And there's been predictions made already for what's going to happen in 2012 based on this survey and that survey. And they, there's all these predictions that may happen and may not happen. But I know one prediction that won't happen that they had been predicting that is the end of the world because we know that won't happen as we've been studying on Wednesday nights until after the rapture, uh, after the rapture seven years, thousand year race, about a thousand seven years at least, and we'll come back today. There won't be the end of the world until about thousand seven years. But uh, anyway, so we know that one won't happen. But there have been predictions and all these that people set forth for 2012, and I was just being told last night of a, a prediction made uh, for the economic. Uh, future of the world and something's going to happen that'll affect the, the whole world. Well, that would that's probably pretty much of a given in my account, not most specifically what uh, they said, but uh, uh, there's predictions being made looking forward to 2012. But at this time of year, people set New Year's resolutions. I don't know if you've written any down, uh, but we tend during this time of year to set goals for the upcoming year for our lives. We look back and see what's happened and we look toward the upcoming year with uh, many of us, I would imagine, I usually do, with great excitement of what the new year has in store and what we can do. And we look for ways that many people do during this time of year to better our lives. Now, the question is, I don't know if you do this or not, uh, if you were to write down your New Year's resolutions, I wonder what they would be. I wonder what would be on the t at the top of our resolutions as we were to write them down if we were to do that. I wonder if for some of us, and this would be one of mine, to lose more weight this year. Okay, Many people put that as a top thing uh, on their New Year's resolutions. Or maybe to pay more bills and get out of debt or to make more money or do better in school or do better at our job or whatever it may be. All these are different top ten things that many people would have on their list of New Year's resolutions. But there is something that may not make it to the top ten of your list or to my list until I was studying this out, but it is very important for all of us to strive for. And I think that that is sanctification. We're going to take a look here in 1 Thessalonians. Let's read our passage. We're going to spend a few weeks talking about this. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. Let's begin in verse number 14. Verse number 14, Now we exhort you, brethren, when uh, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirits, despise not prophesies, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace, here it is, sanctify you wholly, 
And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be, be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Before we go any further, let's have a word of prayer this morning. God, we come before you. We want to give you the praise and the glory for what has happened in 2011. And now, as we look forward to 2012, Lord, may we look to uh, be a blessing to others and to grow spiritually. Lord, we look with excitement and anticipation of what uh, you have in store for us personally and for this church in 2012. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to do our very best to serve you. Today we place this message in your hands. We glorify you for all that will be said and done. So in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. The question is, well, what is sanctification? There are many definitions, but according to the Greek word, as I looked it up, in this word, sanctified means to set from profane things and dedicate to God. That is basically to be set apart. Sanctified means to set apart and to be different from something else. And one of the best illustrations I saw of that was whenever I was a student at Tennessee Temple University, there was a, a pastor who was filling in, and uh, he filled in the pulpit, and he was preaching about sanctification. And he brought up the fact that sanctification means set apart. He had seven kids. That's a lot of kids to have. Uh, and he had seven young children. And he says if one of them had a sucker, they all wanted the sucker. They'd all go for the sucker. But he said what they would do is one of them would grab the sucker and they'd lick it and they go, do you want it now? And of course the other kid would go, no. He said that sucker has been set apart for that child. It has been sanctified. And so that right there is a good illustration of what sanctified is to be set apart and to spiritually mean to dedicate ourselves to God, set apart for God's purpose. This should be the goal for every one of us, to be set apart for God's use. Now in the series we'll take a look at, we're going to give a, a look at these 14, a few verses here, starting at verse 14 uh, throughout the next few weeks, all the way through verse number 24. And we're going to take a look at the recipe for how to be holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, sanctified. Now as we, as we begin the series, what I want us to do, instead of looking at the first verse, I actually want us to get a look at the very end of what the outcome. I don't know about you, but I know whenever Holly's baking cookies or she's making something, I like to kind of go in there and kind of put my finger in the batter a little bit or to taste and see what it's going to taste like. So this morning we'll take a look and take a taste of what is going to happen as we uh, do the following, the verses preceding, verses 23 and 24. Now as we begin a series, we'll take a look here at the end and see the results of verses 14 through 22. But we're going to take a look at verse number 23. It says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's start right there, and as we take a look, one well, of the first things that jumps out at me is that the, as we take a look at this verse, and the very God of peace. You see, God is indeed the God of peace. Over in Philippians, if you turn with me now to Philippians chapter number 4, and we will take a look here at a verse, Philippians chapter number 4, verse number 9, just a few books back. Uh, Philippians chapter number 4, verse 9, here it is written to the church of Philippi, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. There is another reference of God being the God of peace. Our God is not a God of war. Our God is not a God that is a mean God that is looking for ways to be vengeful and hateful and mean. He is indeed the God of peace. And there we see it in verse Number 9 of Philippians chapter 4. Well, turn with me now to the Gospels of Mark chapter number 4. And let's take a look specifically at the God of peace. And I find this very interesting. Mark chapter number 4. As we take a look here. Chapter number 4, starting at verse number 36. 
Here we find the story. Jesus and the disciples are about to go across the sea. And here we're going to find them in the midst of the storm. And we're going to find that God is the God of peace in the storm. Mark chapter number 4, verse number 36, reads as it follows. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were... And there were also with them other little ships. And there arose in verse 37 a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he, re and he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Here it is, Peace! Be still. And how is it that ye have no faith? And well, he says, And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Verse 40. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Here the disciples are in the midst of this great storm. A literal storm in their lives. They don't know what to do. The sea is coming into their ship. Jesus is, of all places, at the bottom and the back of the ship, sleeping on a pillow. When they're about to die, they don't know what to do. So they go back to him and they say, Jesus, do you not even care that we're about to die? I don't know about you, but this past year, 2011, there were maybe a time or two where I thought, Lord, I feel like I'm about to die. Do you not really care I'm about to go under? Do you not really care what I'm going through? Do you not really care? Because it seems like you're asleep, but we know that God never sleeps. He's always aware of what's going on in our lives. So they go to Jesus and they awake and say, do you not even care? And Jesus wakes up and he says, peace, be still. And at that moment, the sea is calm with a great calm. And he turns and notice that he rebukes his disciples. He doesn't say, oh man, thank you for waking me up, man. I almost missed out. Oh man, whoo. I'm glad you woke me up on that one. Boy, I sweat. Didn't know what I was going to do. No. He said in verse 40, why are you so fearful? They're like, uh, hello, the ship was about to go under. You were asleep. What did you think we were going to do? But he says, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? You see, Jesus, even in the midst of the storm, it may seem to us that He's off in the distance or that He's asleep and doesn't even care about what we're going through. But we can rest assured that He knows exactly what's going on. And as, G as long as Jesus is, is in our ship, we are safe till we get to the other side. And I'm so thankful that Jesus, though it may seem at times that He's far away, He knows exactly what's going on. Not only is He the God of peace in the storm, but in Romans chapter number 5, verse number 1, tells us that He is also Jesus, the Son of God, gives us peace with God. In Romans chapter number 5, and verse number 1, it tells us that Jesus gives us peace with God. Let's take a look here. Romans chapter number 5, and verse number 1, tells us this. I get used to turning these new pages here. There it is. Therefore, being justified by faith, here it is, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the peace that God gives us is the peace in the midst of the storm while we are His children. Of course, uh, we believe that once you're saved, you're always His child. He's always in the ship with you until you get to the other side. And as we are born-again Christians, we have Him with us. But here we see that not only does He give us peace in the storm, but He brings peace to us, to God. In other words, He comes in and He brings peace. He is the peacemaker between unreconcilable sin and God the Holy One. And He is the one who has died on the cross for our sins and is the reason why we can have peace with God. So He brings peace to God for us. But not only this, in our passage, we see that He is the God of peace. But also, Paul writes here in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Now, let me briefly talk about sanctification. I was wrestling with this. This whole 
series could be about sanctification, but I just want to touch on it. Here, there are three tenses actually of sanctification. I don't know if you realize this or not. There is a sanctification, remember, it means set apart. First one is positionally. That is, that the believer is set apart in salvation. It is instantaneous and absolute. Once you have been born again, you have been uh, positionally sanctified to Christ. In other words, you will never lose that. You have been sanctified, set apart to God. Now, as we take a look at 1 Thessalonians, we see that it was written to believers. So this is written to those who are already positionally sanctified. Are you with me? Now, the next tense of sanctification is that which is called progressively sanctification. Progressively sanctified. That is, that he, the Christian, the believer, is being set apart all his earthly life. Basically, that is the Christian life. As we draw closer and closer and closer to God, it only makes sense that we get farther and farther and farther away from the world. The world and the devil is at one place. As we grow spiritually, we become more set apart from the world. We become set apart from the world as we grow spiritually to God. Now, verses 14 through 22 is the process of the Christian life as we are to strive to, if you were to put in your uh, New Year's resolutions, this would be a good passage just to go, okay, have I done this, have I done that? And take a look at these things, growing spiritually, it's the Christian life. And then one day, we will be perfectively sanctified. That is, that the believer is glorified and achieves perfect separation unto God at the resurrection. Once we stand before God, and once we have uh, either uh, died, or once we have been resurrected uh, in, the, in the second coming of Christ, in the rapture, once we have been raptured up, we have been then perfectively Sanctified, And this is talking in verse 23 and 24. You can see that in this passage. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. W-H-O-L-L-Y. That word holy means perfect. Complete in all respects. And so it is at this point that we stand before God that we have been perfectly sanctified. That we will no longer have sin in our lives. We'll no longer have the world to deal with. But we'll be completely imperfect as a God is. And I'm going to tell you, I'm thankful that when God does something, He does it all the way. He doesn't sanctify us partially. He doesn't help us a little bit. He does everything good. He does everything to the best of His ability, which is perfection. And He does everything holy, W-H-O. L -L -Y. And so I'm thankful that God will one day as we are Christians, as we're growing in Christ, and one day as we cross over, whether it's the, the sea of death and we go to heaven or whether we're raptured out, one day we will be wholly sanctified. Now, not only do we see this, that's all we're talking about sanctification right now at this point. But not only do we see that the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, but now we're going to see that God is the God of preserving. We're going to see here in verse 23, And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved, blameless, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, here we find Paul, a short prayer for the believers. Here Paul says, I pray that God, I pray God, uh, I mean, and I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved. So he's praying for the believers. What exactly is he praying for here for the believers? He's praying for a few things. Number one, he's praying that the saints be preserved, spirit, soul, and body. That is, completely. And we already know that one day we'll be wholly sanctified, but Paul is praying that the Christian here will be preserved in all three ways, I want to tell you that we will be. That is a promise of God. We'll find that in a moment. That God promises us that He will do what He says. But here Paul is praying that we will be preserved, spirit, soul, and body, completely. The next thing that he prays for is he prays there, and the body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
He prays that we are preserved, body, soul, spirit, preserved, blameless. Now here, blameless, of course, there's nothing to be able to be blamed upon somebody. You, you are living a good, godly life. Now let's take a look here at Jude, uh, the book, little book of Jude, just before the book of Revelation. Little book of Jude, verse number 24, tells us, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. That's another word for blameless. Faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Now, who is this talking about? This is talking about God Almighty. Unto Him that is able to keep you. Can God keep us? Yes, He can. Unto Him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us, to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Now, over in Ephesians chapter number 5, as we turn back a few books now, to Ephesians chapter number 5. This is squeezed just in between the passages where many people don't like preachers to go. It's about the wives and the husbands, but I'm not going to touch that those verses this morning. We're not going there. We're going to stick with Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to take a look here at verse number 25. Here, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll read about the husbands anyway. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it. Why? Verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it, that is the church believers, with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spots or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That is, blameless. Christ's blood, Christ, because of who He is and what He has done, His work at Calvary, as we are Christians and we receive Christ in our hearts, we can be presented as we grow in God's Word before Him faultless. You say, but I'm not faultless. I have faults everywhere. I have sin in my life. I struggle with my flesh. I lose my temper. I get upset. I have a problem with whatever it may be. And I have struggles in my life. And yet, as a Christian, God looks at you, not at your sin, but He looks at you through the blood of Christ. Because the blood of Christ washes us, us and it makes us clean. We can see that in verse 26, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. And of course, we know that the Word is Jesus Christ. And of course, the Bible is the Word of God as well. So as we study God's Word, we are growing spiritually. And what that does is it points out sins in our lives that we must purify and clean. And as we read God's Word, and not just skim God's Word for our daily devotions, but as we read through God's Word, and it points out sins in our lives, we ought to be willing to repent of those sins. And it is a washing and cleansing effect in our lives. Now, Paul prays that the saints be preserved blameless. A man by the name of John Gill had this to say about that passage in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. He wrote this, Not that he, Paul, thought that uh, they could be kept from sinning entirely in thought, word, or deed, but that they might be preserved in purity and chastity from the gross enormities of life and be kept from a total and final falling away. The work of grace be at last completed, and the, on the soul and spirit and the body be raised in incorruption and glory, and both at the coming of Christ be presented faultless and without blame, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, first to himself and then to his Father. Finally, we see in this passage of verse 23, he prays that the saints be preserved blameless when? Until the return of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 23, be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, can that happen? Can that take place? The answer, my friend, is yes. Over in Ephesians chapter number 4, we can find that this does take place. Ephesians 
chapter number 4 and verse number 30 tells us that uh, we can be preserved here in uh, verse number 30 of Ephesians 4. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit has sealed us. He will preserve us until the day of redemption. Until the day that we stand before Christ, we have been sealed with a seal and set forth on a mission, so to speak, to the King. And that uh, we cannot be unchanged, we, or we cannot be changed, we cannot be moved. That seal of the Holy Ghost is upon us until the day of redemption. The Holy Ghost is as a seal, an airtight seal that is there. You know, you go to the store and they have the little seals that you try to break open. Some of them are very hard. Better yet, I don't know if y'all ever canned or try to open up these homemade canning uh, green beans or whatever. You take the lid off and then you have that little piece of metal there on the jar and you try to open that. Sometimes I have to take a knife to kind of pry in there. Well, that's just like the Holy Spirit, just as that lid is on that jar that has been sealed, we are sealed with the Holy Ghost. And that lid will not come off until we stand before Christ and we are made whole and complete. We are sealed until the day of redemption. If we were not sealed to the day of redemption, that would not be in the Bible. And God, if He said, well, you're sealed to the day of redemption, but you're really not, that would make God a liar. We dare not do that. We know that we are sealed until the day of redemption. Let me end with verse number 24. We say that's a lot. Talking about being sanctified holy and being kept blameless. But here's the good part. All of this is not done in our strength. All of this is not done by our part. All of this is done through verse 24. Faithful is He that called you. Who also will do it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been called to be set apart. We have been called to be sanctified. And Paul in verses 14 through 22 has laid out step by step for us to complete these different tasks or these different missions to, uh, to become wholly sanctified. Which means that verses 14 through 22 are verses that we should be working on continually in our lives as we grow, but that even though we do these things, it is done not in our own strength. It is done in the power of God. You see, God will not leave us high and dry. He will not call us to do something. Go, well, you've done that. I called you to do it. Now, good luck. Hopefully, you make it. I'll see you on the other side. He does not do that. He doesn't leave you out there high and dry to try to fend for yourself. He doesn't do it at all. Paul tells us, faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Not only will he call you, but he will perform it. You see, we can do nothing good of our own. The Bible says that there's no goodness in man. We are wicked. There is nothing good in us. Even our righteousness is like filthy rags. Even if we try to become more and more set apart, there is still that sin nature in us that, are, that is constantly battling us. We can only do that through the Holy Spirit, through God, through God the Father, and through the Trinity, actually, Jesus Christ as well, giving us the strength to do what He has called us to do. The Christian life, listen closely, must be lived not in our power. This is where many Christians fall short. This is where many Christians go astray. We think, well, I'm a, I'm a pretty good Christian. People say, well, I go to church. I'm a good Christian. I pass out a gospel tract every once in a while. I'm a good Christian. I read the Bible every day. I'm a pretty good Christian. I pray most of the time. I'm a pretty good Christian. By whose standards are you a pretty good Christian? Because as we take a look, we'll find that we're to pray without ceasing. That we're to be good towards all men. That we're to live peaceable with all men. And if we're not doing that, we are not a good Christian. We can only do that through the power of God. So the Christian life is not lived in our power. It is lived in the power of God. People have said, well, I can't become a Christian because it's too hard to live a Christian life. 
I say, you're right, not only is it too hard, it is impossible to live the Christian life because as soon as my flesh takes over living the Christian life, I've all of a sudden fallen short of where I should be spiritually. It is God's power is how I can live the Christian life. And only by walking in God's power can we live the Christian life and become more and more set apart. Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by, by my word, saith the Lord of hosts. We cannot do it. We cannot live a life that will glorify God. It is, not, it is only through God's power that we can do any of the things that we've mentioned, or that has been mentioned as we read our text in verses 14 through 22. It's only through Him. The Christian life must be lived through the faithfulness of God and His power, as we see in verse 24. So what does this mean? Today, I want to challenge every one of us to depend less on ourselves, our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, our reasoning, and depend more on God and His power. This new year, I want us to resolve to live a more set-apart, sanctified life. I think we should try to resolve to grow in the Lord. Let's resolve to depend on Him for our walk and the strength needed for the journey ahead in 2012. He has called us to sanctification. And He will do for us what He has called us to do. Stop trying to do it in our own flesh and say, God, I'm yours. Stop fighting. God, I'm yours. Live in the power of God because in our own fleshly power, we fall short every day. <coughs> every day. Faithful is He that calls you who also will do it. Bow your head to close your eyes this morning. <coughs> As we think about what God has done in 2011, looking forward to 2012. Have we try to live so much in 2011 in our own strength? This 2012, I challenge us on this first day of January 2012, to not live in our own strength, but strive to live more in God's power. Surrendering to God. Surrendering our will to God. Surrendering even our thoughts to God. Surrendering even our stubborn ways to God. Our little practices that we like to do. Surrendering everything to God. And living in His strength. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, 